So I will take over the screen share. Yeah. But I'm, I'm also showing the same document. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay, good. And does that look correct? It does. Yes. Good. Okay, so let's get back. So we already talked a bit with the icebreakers and people can read those, but... Um... Yeah, so where do we start? So we are, our first lesson is automated testing. Yeah, so Which... um, yeah, let's get down to it. So, um, or first, uh, before yeah. you learn the automated testing, um, can, can we uh, what share did you the do? lesson? Um, yes, we can. So the link is in the notes and also in the schedule. And here we go. Okay. Yeah, and I guess this title show is exactly what our icebreakers were asking, preventing yeah. yourself and others from breaking functional code. So. Yeah, so yeah. what's the way you do this, like without automated testing? What were you doing before you learned, and what what are uh, what are people probably doing before learning about this? Yeah. Um, Can we go to motivation? Maybe. So I guess the first motivation lesson has some. So. Yeah, and this first point, mm. if you've ever been an experimental scientist you probably know that calibrating your instruments is a important thing you do. So you have to get there. And like anytime you have some microscope or measurement thing, you run it with a known sample to see if it gives the value you expect. And we see a quote here that says the same thing should apply to software. If you haven't done some sort of test to see if it works, then are you really doing science or are you uh, just making some hopes or whatever? So this would be something like checking that you can reproduce known results. And essentially like every time you change something, move the thing around or um, just come into the lab in the morning doing some basic checks that everything is okay. Yeah. Um, so let's give an example if um, we scroll down. So yeah. when you're programming, you might have some function. So here, can the font be made a little bit larger? Yes. Okay, that's hopefully good, yeah. So what do we see here? Yeah, so this is... um. This is Python. Um, there's other examples here, but yeah, function that converts from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Um, Which is pretty easy. Yeah. And we can look at it and we think it works. But how would yeah. you actually test it in real life? Like if you're making this function and you didn't know automatic testing, yeah. how would you? Say? So I guess I would run it with some number I know the result for. Like I would run it with um, temperature in Fahrenheit uh, being zero because I know it should return 32. Um, not exactly because that's the wrong way around. Yeah. Um, I would give it 32 and then mm -hmm. expect zero, I guess. Yeah. So you give it the known yeah. obvious values. Yeah. And since you can probably know your function is linear, if you can test two values, then it's probably good. In this case, that would be enough. Yeah. Um, but then, but are you sure? Yeah. Actually, I mean, I guess it's worth testing a few more if it's easy, and also some special cases like yeah. negative Kelvin. Does that give you something, or null values, and so on? Yeah, integer and floating point um, inputs. But anyway, so this is what we're going to see during this lesson. And this is at the smallest, most micro scale, testing a single function. But you can also test much more than this. Um, so, for example, down below we see a test of a whole program. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, not like that far down, but just okay. the little. Oh, you mean Python. this one? Yeah. Yes. 
I mean, we don't see what it actually is, but yeah, it shows, it looks like it runs with some sample data and says this is what the output should be. Yeah. So, yeah. So it is telling us that it's correct, which is good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so but, what else? Um, yeah. yeah. So what else can the test help us do? I mean, I guess in addition to telling whether it's wrong or right, um, it would be useful to know where the problem is or how the test figured out that there's a problem. Like this just tells you that it's correct, um, which I guess is fine as long as it's correct. Yeah. Um, but it would be nice to know what it checked. Yeah. More nice to be reminded. Um, yeah. What was the check? What what passed? Yeah. And if it fails, where did it fail? Yeah. And how? Can we scroll down a bit to see what else is in, what else it says? Yeah. So preserve functionality. Okay, so that means that if it works, it keeps working. Help users. So basically, actually this happens often on our computer cluster. We install some software for a user and we wonder, did the installation work correctly? If yeah. we, um, if we, the admins can run a test suite and it says it works, then we have some reasonable confidence that we didn't completely break the installation. <clears throat> Help other developers modify it. What does that mean? Mm. So, well, if you're changing something, you can be confident that you didn't break anything. Yeah. Um, it's also kind of helps with documentation. It, it tells you what should work and how it should behave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like for example, if someone, if I'm modifying someone else's code and there's tests, then I can run those tests. And if they pass, then like if it's someone else's code, I usually don't know how the whole thing works, but I might know enough to change just a little bit of it. But I don't know how my section relates to all the other sections of the code. So having these tests is really useful because I can be reasonably sure that I haven't broken something unexpected. And same for the other developer. If I say, oh, would you like this change? Then they can see if the tests still work and not have to read my changes so much. They can just look locally. And this complexity is also a good one. Um, I've written some things before that are really hard to test and eventually they become hard to modify and maintain. And that's just not great. Yeah. There's a good question. Is this about testing code? What about other mm. things, Python? This is a really good point. And for example, the thing that we'll show later on, GitHub Actions, has exact ways to do this. You can basically install, like test installing and running your code, your package on different operating systems, on different versions of the operating <clears throat> system, and so on. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really helpful. Um, yeah. And if you want okay. to test that it's installed correctly in your system, then hopefully you can also run the tests included in the package. Yeah. Um, so once it okay to not add tests, the next section here. Mm, yes. Um, ah, we should be. I will also add this as a question to the yeah. notes. So you can ask, is everything that we do tested? And the answer is probably no. And to me, it depends on how important it is. If it's a small script that I will also always be, there will always be a human in the loop watching it and verifying it worked, then yeah, whatever. But as soon as it gets big enough, I'll try to have some at least sample data to um, show. Yeah. So often the time when it's 
really time to start adding tests is when you're going from a single script or a Jupyter notebook to um, to having some functions and uh, having multiple files and so on, at, at least for me. Um, but of course, if, if you have an, a big untested block of code in a notebook or a script, then that's maybe not as trustworthy as, um, as it could be. And maybe that's fine. So okay. um, what are some examples of things that are easy and hard to test in your own opinion? Okay, let's move that also to the notes and see what people come up with. Um, what's hard to test is interactive things. Mm -hmm. Something that requires a human in the loop to properly yeah. work. Like you, you can simulate a human by some predefined answers, but it, yeah. it, it's not quite the same thing. There are also things like testing frameworks, which basically, like for web browsers and so on, that can go and virtually click on things on a website and see if it works. But since our audience is probably scientists and researchers that might be getting a bit deep but you can bet for sure that big companies making websites and so on have these kinds of things because well yeah. it's yeah. better to do it once than need a human to do it all the time okay should we go on um there's some other advice here, but I think you'll probably see the types of tests. Well, you can read that yourself later. We don't really need to go. Yeah. I guess the main point there is you can test at different levels. Like above, we saw a test of a single function, but maybe for your case, it's better to get some sample data and test the whole thing, like an end-to-end -end test or whatever. Oftentimes, it's some combination. I would try some end-to-end -end test and then test of individual functions where it's easy and the risk of breakage is high. So where do we start? Um, yes, so let's go to the next is... section. But at this point, I think I will move on to the um, my yeah. empty example uh, okay. folder. And we can start because the next section is an is a demonstration. Yes, so we so, are at the section okay. testing locally. Um, yeah. Maybe, well, is there anything we need to show from the web browser window? Maybe I'll show on my screen quickly. So, okay, that works. Yeah, I got it. So here we are on testing locally. The link is in the notes and we will be using PyTest. So we'll start with some simple code which was provided to us and we will slowly add it to files and make some tests. And this is a really reasonable thing to do. So PyTest is what, uh, at least my default package for testing Python code. It's really common, it's relatively easy to use. So yeah, it's a good it's, start. Um, I actually, I cannot say that I've seen any other um, framework being used to test Python. Um, there are other <laughs> okay, frameworks yeah. and people use them, but in Python, I, yeah, it, it's essentially the only one. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'll create a new um, Python file example.py okay and put yeah. some code so, there so so we, so we start with example.py did you make a new directory to store this stuff yes this is an this should be an empty directory but i did try running pytest to check that it exists uh, so there is okay. a pytest cache yeah folder okay here. so we're adding example.py and it has and so this is supposed to be a demo so you can try to follow yeah. along but we're not giving you time and we're not going slow enough that we think it's easy to follow. 
Okay, so um, I have this um, extremely complicated mathematical function, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and I want to test it. So, yeah. so what should I do? So the way PyTest okay. works is it looks for functions that it automatically looks for functions that start with test underscore. It also okay. looks for modules that start with test underscore, but we don't do that yet. So let's define a function called test add, test okay. underscore add. Yeah, so okay. the important thing is that it starts with test underscore. And then um, I guess I will write um, in the function name what I'm testing. So I'm testing the add function. Um, let's close the okay. side panel. Okay, so um, so what does assert mean? Here? I went a bit ahead of my house. So sorry. So yeah. um, assert. Um, what does that do? It's um, is it self-descriptive? It might so, be if you speak enough English. Um, so assert is a Python statement which runs whatever is after it, and if it is not, if it doesn't evaluate to true, it prints an error. Okay. So PyTest so, uses this. It uses standard Python uh, statements. But if there was an assertion error, it would capture that error and then print some extra debugging information beyond what Python would do. So what if there's a different kind of an error? What do you mean by different kind? Um, well, I don't know. Um, I, I give some parameters that um that you cannot add together uh well i think python would probably or pytest would also capture that and print it well okay so any I error assume. will um yeah pytest will capture any error essentially but assert is a nice way of producing errors when things don't work okay well let's um should we add something that evaluates to true so if we add two and three that should be equal to five. No, five. <laughs> okay. Um, what else? What else would work? Um, so, what else in Python should be added? Well, there's this. We see it. Ex it adds two strings together. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's try that. So the way strings work is if you try to add uh, with the plus operator, um, two words, space and ship, okay. and that should return space ship. So it just puts the strings together, yeah. concatenates the strings. OK. Okay. So now we have our test function. And notice the test function takes no arguments. So Python automatic, yeah. no, PyTest automatically finds it and runs it. It has all the test data directly embedded in here, as you can see, and will print yeah. any errors it finds. So. Okay. Perhaps. Open a terminal window. Yeah. I will need to activate the code refiner environment. Yes. Can we Here split the window so we can see? Yes. So, oops, looking at the tests okay. and the. There's not a huge amount of space. Can you um, split the window so it's on the bottom? Right. That's a good idea. Um, yeah should be possible. OK. OK. Yeah, so there's this a works. question um, in the chat. What are we trying to do here? Um, so we have some pretend code, which is add A and B. We pretend this is our highly advanced scientific code. And we want to demonstrate a test for it. So we run this thing called test add. So we've made a function test add, and PyTest will automatically run this for us with some nice extra stuff. So, so the simplest will... way to run this function would be to run PyTest, and that's it. Yeah, so we do PyTest. I think we need to tell it example.py. Yeah. Um, that's true. It will, because example.py doesn't start with test underscore we need to give it the file name. Okay. But let's also add a verbose flag to so that it will okay. tell us what it's doing. Mm -hmm. Give some more information. Okay. 
So we see test session starts, whatever. Yes. So it ran test add and said that it passed. Yes. It it did tell us that it yeah it ran the test add function. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, all it did is run this function and it didn't encounter any any errors, so it passed. Yeah. So if we had a hundred times more code here and 20 different test functions, we could run them all automatically all at once. And yes, okay. and in this case, the testing function is doing nothing more than running the function with some real life values. Of course, you yeah. can get more advanced, but that's essentially what testing is running stuff with sample values and seeing if it comes out right. So what happens is, this is if really something's easy. broken? Should we do a test and see? OK. Um, um, to make a break the function um, yeah. in. Um, yeah, so now, now it's clearly not adding. Mm -hmm. um, so I will not run it from here. I will run it from here um, yeah. in the terminal. So PyTest, okay. okay. So now it gives a lot more information. Yeah, and we see a really nice error message. It says, failures test add, def test add, assert add two, three equals five. It says that assert minus one equals five or minus one equals add two comma three. So, so if we had a hundred different test functions here, we could go and know exactly which function failed and with with which arguments. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's the basic idea. And there was some comment in the notes about how unit they someone was using unit test. And it seemed really hard and in a lot of boilerplate. And you notice here this is really easy. Yeah, there's not that much boilerplate in here. Um, just fixing yeah. the code um, to make the test pass again. OK, yeah. yeah, I'm. these are all one line tests. Of course, the function is very simple. So writing one line tests is easy, but still. Yeah. Um, so the next part here is a test in the episode is a test that considers numerical tolerance. So can we add as a test, add okay. 0 0.1 and 0 0.2? So we assert something. We want 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 um, equal to 0 0.3. I'm actually curious if this will work or not. No, it did no. not work. So why does this work? Yeah. So here. Um, Adding 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 produces 0 0.3, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 4, because it's a floating point number. So it goes in powers of two. Yeah. Um, yeah, and floating point numbers are never quite exact. Yeah. So what's the solution here? Mm, what do we do? Yeah, good question. Um, I guess we could check that the difference between the result and 0 0.3 is small enough. So basically, we would um, test with numerical tolerance somehow. Yes. So, so should we, we try see, that? Yeah, like is the um, difference small enough? So we take the difference. But now we want the absolute value of the difference. Mm -hmm. Because also, if it's negative, that is not good. But this is some number, and um, it should be smaller than some arbitrary number, let's say. In the notes, it says, um, yeah. The power of 7. One is this? Minus 7. So basically, this is okay. close enough? Yeah. OK. Does it pass now? Now it passes. OK. Great. Let's go to the notes. We have some really good questions there. I'll switch. Okay here okay. locally. Um, so towards the bottom. So 
Yeah, so there's lots of questions about how this works with more advanced code. So this is simple. So whenever I'm doing things, so okay, there's the classic case. You have some simple functions, but you're writing code not because you know the answer, but because you don't know the answer. So what do you do? So several things I would do. I'd break down the big complicated code I don't know the answer to into small pieces and make sure each individual piece is tested and correct. So that way known things are simple, but the complicated thing, hopefully it's correct with the known parts. Can you get any really simple sample data? So for example, you make a test function that processes millions of records from somewhere, you give it a list of two records and see, can it average this correctly? So basically in your mind, there's all different ways you can think and try to simplify things down to a smaller example. And actually in uh, after the break, we go to a test design episode where we'll talk about this a lot more. So maybe save some of these questions and Let's discuss more there. There'll be lots of time. Um, yeah, this is, yeah, so many of these test design functions, let's get to in the test design episode and not now. Do you see a question? Can you test a particular test function without running through all the functions in the file? So you can tell PyTest yeah. run only this particular test function and so on. Do you remember the syntax um, for that? Or is I it something we should just... I think it's dash K. Someone uh, should check. You can look it up as easy as we can look it up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh. Uh, um. And we always have a test in the file that we're wishing to test. Um, not necessarily. Yeah. You can split them into, into a separate file. And that's something yeah. people do often, or even a separate folder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess for big enough projects, I usually see the test in separate, um, yeah. separate files. Um, Okay, there's a mention of this benefit of this approach versus plain code that can be automated. Um, I'm not quite sure what that means, but I'll answer what I think it means. So, what do I think it means? Um, so, you could have a separate script, basically a separate Python program that imports this module and then run some stuff and says, is it correct or not? But that's not that different from what we have here. And PyTest provides some extra, um, like all these extra debugging error messages. But you select certain things if you want to test only that. It will print output if you want to or don't want to. But that being said, quite often I do basically have a test function that you know, it's just a plain Python code. It loads stuff, does an analysis, and prints, is it correct? So there's times they start that way or have that in addition. The point isn't to use only PyTest. The point is to see that you actually can make these tests. And maybe next let's go to automated test and leave more of these questions for the break and final discussion because i think a lot yeah. might become clear later yeah so okay with that being said uh let's see first i'll come to my screen so automated testing so we did this ourselves so what if you forget to run pytest um, so the part we did ourselves, well, we did write the tests, but um, we ran PyTest manually, I guess, mm -hmm. is what you mean. Yeah. If I forget to run it, the tests don't run, and then I can easily make changes that break something. Right? Yeah. It, the tests don't really do much if they don't run, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, 
So it, it is nice to set it up so that they run automatically. Yeah. And that's what we're going to so. see. So we're going to see how GitHub on every push and pull request is able to run all of the tests that we have defined. So uh, let's go back to Yarno screen if you're ready. Yes. Okay. So what should we do next? Um, we, I guess we want to publish this. Um... Yeah. So we will take the same exercise repository. Yeah. Or is it the same one? Well, um, no, it says make a new one. OK, fine. Um, I guess we can what? use the same directory, though, because it's pretty yeah. similar. So we do need to make a new repository, because this is not the repository. This is this is not using Git. Mm, yeah. OK, yeah. Um, so, so I need to go and initialize. I could directly publish to GitHub um, as we go. Yeah. Let's so, try that because we are going to need to do this at some point. Yeah. Right. Yes. And now you're going to see us use everything we've learned during the past two weeks. So we will see using Git from day one. You will see using making GitHub repositories from days two and three. You will see us setting up a GitHub Actions like in day five. And how this can be yes. made social in day um, four. Okay. So this might be fast, but we'll tell you and we'll slow down in the important parts. Yeah. OK, so um, yeah, my um, the user interface here, VS Code, does um, a good number of steps in one go when I click here. OK, so. Uh, yeah. What do I want to include? Not the PyTest cache, not PyCache, just example.py. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there we go. Open GitHub. Um, where should I go next? Um, should I keep showing the code or should I go to the new GitHub page? Oh, uh, maybe let's show what we would really do in real life. So would you be using VS Code for um, make it? Well, OK, what, what do I want to do next? Time. What's the next step? Um, so what I want to achieve is I want yeah. these tests to run automatically uh, whenever I make a change, or mm -hmm. at least often enough that I don't forget. So how would you do that? So wait, let's. Let's back up here. So now we're doing the example under automated testing. And it gives us some sample code to add to a repository, a functions.py file. OK. OK, let's so do that. I guess Yarno will go and copy the Yes, functions. so um, we'll create a functions.py file. And um, we have, this is quite similar actually to the example.py in that yes. it has this add function. But now we also have a subtract function. Yeah. Um, it has this comment because I copied it directly from the notes, but you can also see that comment, so fine. Yeah. Um, it has a multiply function. And we will also have this one I missed. Um, Fahrenheit to Celsius or convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. Yeah. Which uses these other functions. Okay. So this okay. code is provided in the exercise and we will commit it and push it to GitHub now. Okay. So add it. Um, and Yarno is quickly here doing all the Git committing stuff. We're not explaining it again. Yes. Commit message. And then push the changes to GitHub. OK, there we are. But now we don't have any tests for this functions module. Yes. But we add that later. OK. Or do we add it later? Yes, we do um, add it now. Yeah, that is, um, I guess, the next step. Yes. Or so at we... least it's a necessary step on the way. Yes. So. Um, 
So what am I add, doing here? I should explain as I go. We um, add a file test underscore functions dot py. So like as you said, um PyTest will also check for files or modules with the name test underscore something. And now we actually don't directly have access to these um, functions. So we we need to import them. So let's say from functions, import add. Should you copy and paste from right. the mm, maybe exercise? I this is um, this is Python, and it's also hopefully clear enough. Yeah. So I will rename the convert Fahrenheit to Celsius function as I import it into F2C, but otherwise I'm directly imp uh, importing the ones we have. Okay, and this first test is what we already saw. Um, add two and three equals five and add space and ship equals spaceship. Mm -hmm. Should I include the other test as well? Yes, copy everything. We will uncomment okay. it later. Okay, so we'll keep them commented for now. Yes. And I suppose um, I feel like I'm so, done with something, so I will add and commit. Yeah. So, okay. and now Yarno's doing the committing, which we yes, it's seen pushed. before. Yeah. Okay. So step two in our exercise or demo is to run the test locally. Okay, so we did that already. Let's try it. So now we just we can now just run pytest and it will find the test underscore file, mm -hmm. um, this test underscore functions, and it will find one test and it passed. Yes. So collected one item means this, but there was one test. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it seems good. Okay. Um, so next up in our demo is to enable automated testing. So now we switch to the GitHub view. Okay, so let's go there. And this is the GitHub repository. It opened in my browser window when I clicked open. Um, and it is, um, well, it is this PyTest example. So it has an example.py. Um, I need to refresh and it should have more files. Yes, okay, functions and test functions, good. Yes. So we can, now we do, this is the main part, the main point of what we're doing here. So we will tell GitHub that every time there's a push, run PyTest on testfunctions.py. And we do that via GitHub Actions, which okay. if you look at the top, the tab bar. So there's Actions. So click there. Okay. And then, I don't have any actions yet, so it's suggesting a number of things I can run. Yes. And one of them is Python application. Yes. Okay. So go there. And it even nicely says create and test a Python application. Yeah. And it gives okay. us a bunch of boilerplate. So uh -huh. this basically is what you need here. But I think there's some edits that we'll do. Okay. Um, what do we need to change? So it says to modify the highlighted line. So we need to say jobs pool requests have write access. Um, I'd probably mm -hmm. copy from the notes. Yeah. So it needs write access to pull requests. So, oh, right, to post comments to the pull requests. Yeah. Okay, yes. And we'll see what these things do later, but this is basically yeah. lots of different configuration. Yeah, um, okay, so let's add. Um, under install dependencies, we need to tell it to install Flake 8, PyTest, and PyTest-Cov. 
So this is something called test coverage, which we will talk about later. And then and down here, below... instead of just running the test, which would work and run the tests, we will also use this coverage report then. Yes. And let's okay. see, does this match? So before we leave this window, let's slow down and take a look at what it does. This is called YAML and it's a configuration, well, it's a simple markup language. It defines data. So we see on line 15, there's jobs. There's a job with the name build. It gives some permissions and steps. And it uses, it says first checkout, it sets up Python, it installs some things. And if you look at lines 31 to 33, this yeah. doesn't look, this is basically the same kind of stuff you can run in a terminal. So right. this is basically creating a virtual machine of some sort and letting you run Python stuff inside. Uh, there's lint with flake eight, line 42. We see it runs PyTest with this extra option coverage report. So these options are new to us, but PyTest is not new. So it's running the same thing we've run before, but automatically. And if PyTest detects any errors, it will exit with a failure. And then GitHub Actions will detect, ah, PyTest failed, and then give us a warning. And that's the okay. main point here. Yeah. Um, so, so when will it, it run? It will run whenever we push um, to the main branch or whenever there's a pull request to the main branch, yes. which is often enough for me. Yeah. But... Okay. Okay. So, so one. yes. So it says commit changes. Okay. Let's do that. Um, add testing workflow and commit. Okay. Okay, so Did what if something happened? Yeah. Can we go back to the code view? Yeah. So There's, what if we um, this yellow thing that we saw okay. previously? So what what have we done now? So we have made some code locally. We set up PyTest, and now we've told GitHub to run the test we've made on every push and pull. And yes, there's been a lot of different code and stuff we pasted here and there, but you can, you don't, like, we have gone fast. You haven't had time to read everything we've been pasted. The point is that now GitHub is running it, as we see from this yellow dot. Can you click on the yellow dot? Yeah. So it is actually done. Okay. We can still go take a look, but it's done. And here is the yeah. section where it runs test. So it has completed the test. Yes. So. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry, I out of habit moved back, but um, is there something else you want to point out there? Yeah. Can, can we go back? Okay. Let's give people time to take a look and see. So now here, GitHub has run all of the different rules we've defined. It checked out the repository, set up Python, run PyTest, and PyTest worked. So it will run it on every commit. So let's continue. So oh, okay. we've done this verification that it's run. So let's add a test that reveals a problem. So I guess Yarno can go back to VS Code. Yes, just move the window here. So um, I believe that is this next step. Um, test subtract. Yes. So first, can you do git pull to get all the updates? Yes. That happens by clicking here. 
And now we can see that we have added this um, workflow here. So now GitHub has the file we added on GitHub is now present in our local repository. So since we're yeah. up to date, yeah. we can do some new things. Okay. Okay, so let's um, uncomment this function and save. Yeah. And now, um, given the that we've um, you said we've uncovering a problem, I assume this test will fail if we run it. Mm -hmm. So should we try it locally or just push? Let's and see what happens. Commit and push. Okay. Test subtract. So we added a new test for the subtract function and push it to GitHub. And I will show the GitHub view again, go to the main view. And now it's again running the tests. Okay. Let's go to the action view instead. Um, okay. So it shows the previous one that worked and now there's a new push that's, um, well, the tests for that new push are running. We'll see, um, it usually doesn't take very long, but we'll see. Yeah. Oh, you can actually see how far it's progressed yeah. by clicking on it. Oh, it's so done. We okay. see it fail. Yes. Okay. And um, now, now I think it's the time I take over the screen share as your partner and okay. make the fix. So yep. I will click here. So can someone, or actually I can paste this repository in the notes. So here I am, I'm logged in. Uh, why don't I see the dot that shows the failure? If I click on oh, action, interesting. I see a test yeah. failure. So what do I do? So first I'll make an issue about it. So I click on the Issues tab, click on New Issue. I'll be quick about it. So this issue says there's a bug and test some scrap. I'll work on it. So basically someone knows that it's there and it's being fixed. Of course, if someone was working on your own project, you would just fix it. But here we're showing if something was bigger, took more time, and we wanted to synchronize better. So how do I fix it now? Well, we go back to day three, and I would make a pull request. And I guess I will do that through the GitHub web interface. So I click on code. And we know from, ah, now there's the red X. So we know from GitHub that I can edit directly here. So I click on mm. functions and I've identified the problem. I know that I can click on edit in GitHub and make the change. So if this was a big enough project, I'd be fixing it on my own computer, but for a demo, this is good. I need to fork the repository. And notice that Yarno hasn't given me any permissions here. So for any other code online, I could be doing the same things. So I fix the subtract function with one line. I will commit changes. So this is all happening quickly, but it's day three kinds of things. Uh, the commit message will be and then the extended descriptions uh, so 
I'm giving some notes about what it was, and I will propose changes. So here we go. So again, this is day three kind of stuff. So there's my head repository of RKDarst, and I'm sending it to the other repository. There, I see the changes. I will create pull request, and it's the same things here. I should include in the description fixes number one. So the issue number, so the issue will be automatically linked and closed and created. And now, uh, here's the cool part. Mm. So it says that I cannot um, update it. And also, I have a feeling that it's not running the tests because now GitHub doesn't run tests from new contributors. So let's switch back to yeah. Yarno screen if yes. you're ready. Yes, I'm ready. OK. OK. So if you go to the pull request view. Yeah, so now um, I know that I have a new issue and a new pull request. Um, so if I go to the new pull request, fix the subtract function, nice. Um, the yeah, the test hasn't started running because I haven't approved um, that Richard can run tests um, in my repository or can run workflows. So I will approve it. Okay. And now and they're running. It's running, and we just wait a second for it to turn green. Yep. And we will see, does it work? OK, while that's happening, um, it says it fixes, uh, changes plus to one, plus to minus. Oh, the it checks failed. Have failed. I okay. wonder why. I was going to go here to see that so the plus has been changed to minus. That yeah. seems fine. OK, let's, um, let's take a look at the, I guess the fastest way is to go through the pull request yeah, here. Let's click on details. So what happened? Oh, Create the coverage, coverage report. Part failed. So the tests passed, okay. but something failed here. Resource not accessible by integration. Well, OK. okay. Um, this is something, well, no, I, this is something we added. Um, yeah. I guess I, we'll leave it be. I guess this is what we call the demo effect. So something yeah. in GitHub has changed. But, okay. Well, so, the test did pass, so I'm fine with merging the pull request. Yeah. Confirm merge. Here we go. And uh, the pull request is automatically closed, and the issue is also automatically closed. Yes. OK. Now, since um, the main branch has been updated, it's actually, again, running the test here. Yes. I'm, I'm kind of interested in it, it, whether it will actually work here or not. Uh, um, but we'll see. I guess this is because it couldn't write to the pull request or something or save the data. Yes, now it did work. OK. So... Um, so actually, uh, creating the coverage thing doesn't work from a pull request now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, um, we can fix that later. Yeah. But, um, and we also noticed the issue is closed. Yes. So I guess I will switch back to my screen. And let's wrap up and go to the break. Yeah. Okay. So this was relatively fast work here. We used PyTest. We made the same example. We committed to GitHub. 
we added a test in GitHub, which can run PyTest on every single commit. Whether Yarno makes it or whether someone makes the commit in a pull request. And this can really remove the friction in uh, contributing to projects. So I make a project, I add some tests. Once people start contributing, I'll make sure that the GitHub tests are set up. So that way, when someone sends something, I can see really quickly, has it worked? And also the person submitting can see before and see, okay, like have I done everything I need before the original author should take their time to look at it? And this helps a lot. Um, it works for both the centralized and forking workflows for one repository or multiple repositories. And GitHub Actions can run on Windows, Mac, Linux operating systems. It has this marketplace to run different kinds of things easily. Basically, it's this thing that automatically adds um, things to you. It's completely free for public projects in line with GitHub's normal philosophy. But this is not only a GitHub thing. So GitLab has a CI kind of thing. There's And there's other services, some of which provide free time and builds for open source projects. So I propose now that we go to our break and we will, um, we can keep taking questions then. And the next episode, we will go into test design. And there, a lot of the question people have been asking, like how does this apply to a big complicated project that's not these really simple functions? We will start discussing them then. So start adding your questions. Um, anything else for now? No, I think that's fine. Okay. We'll get to the hard questions Good. in the next section. So, so let's go to the break and see you in 10 minutes at 13 past hour. Bye. We are back, I hope. Okay. Mm. And I see some messages from the streaming software. I hope that's not bad. Okay, so, well, um, um, is everything okay with people in the stream? Yeah. So now we go to test design. And people have been asking previously how does this work whenever I have some really complicated code? I can't make a two-line function that tests it. Should I really have a lot of small test functions for everything? And now is the time to ask those questions. We probably can't answer everything, but write it in the notes. And I mean, this is really the core here. Like, it's really easy to give these demos and show use PyTest on a one-line function. Whenever you're testing a software that uses random numbers and has thousands of lines and has no one fixed results, how do you even test it? How do you make sure it's correct? I mean, you have to have something, right? Because if you don't even know what the right answer would be, how do you know that it's giving what it should? So, um, yeah, and for a lot of it, like there's there's the first question that's been asked. Do you have a practical way to test low level functions that interact with external hardware? So once I was reading something and it was like, here's a way you can run the Linux kernel on custom hardware. And it has some network interface, which is used for running tests. So when you have questions like this, if you say something, okay, this is hard to test, do some web searches, and I bet someone has figured out how to do it before. 
just because yeah. well yeah yeah i assume this is a common problem i've dealt with it a couple of times um yeah i guess in practice it ended up being quite similar it's not exact so you need some tolerance you, you check yeah. that an absolute value is smaller than a number um and yeah. uh, of course the tests run slower because a physical thing needs to move from place to place <laughs> mm -hmm. while it's running yeah and maybe we don't see it here but a lot of test design is structuring the code so that it can be tested so if you have one thousand line function that's really hard to test. But can you break it down into 800 line functions, which are complicated but can be tested, but the unknown part is just contained in a very few parts. So what you can't test, you can audit separately. So anyway, this episode we're about to cover is normally a exercise and we would give you a lot of time to basically well I'll scroll down quickly here you would see there's a lot of different functions sample functions and we would challenge you to test them but we're going to do that ourselves do we have time to do all of them or should we focus on a few or should we just discuss some of them? What do you think? Mm, well, I think probably not all of them. We probably don't have time to do all of them. Um, yeah. I guess um, so. The, if when things come up in the in the notes, it's probably yeah. worth discussing. And otherwise, we'll, yeah, we could pick some of these and actually write the tests. Yeah. So what maybe. Do you think? Maybe let's start at the beginning and, but depending on what people request, we'll jump to those. So I will switch to Yarno's screen. Okay. And I'll be doing actual coding. Yes. So I will um, show the okay. VS code window. So do you make a new file to put these in? Or and that would make sense. How would we so let's um, do this? What's the first example? Um, the first factorial ex example. The first example is this factorial function. So, so we'll call this factorial.py. Since the solution is basically the same as what we've done already, should we actually do it or should we discuss? I'd say let's um, discuss. Yeah, maybe it's enough to discuss. So um, maybe I'll switch back to my screen then. Okay. So we see here the proposed solution is basically what we've already done. It adds, it tests some values. Um, how do we test really big values? Can it even be tested in this case? There is a limit to how large a normal integer can be. Yeah. Um, is there in, in, in modern Python? Like, it, um, so there is a way you can handle really big integers, yeah. but is that built in in modern Python? I'm not actually sure. I think so. I think Python by default will go to big int. Okay. And then, yeah. So I guess in I mean, theory, this works for anything big. Yeah. Are you happy with these tests here? Do you think this is enough? What else would you test? I would like to see some, to test some larger numbers because this could easily be uh, hard coded into the function. Mm -hmm. So a larger integer. So I guess at least one example case that would go to the big integer realm. Yeah, that would be nice. Okay. Um, and um, to check that that's correct, like you would first compute it somehow by hand or in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing is, what if you give it an incorrect thing? 
uh, like uh, something that's not a number or yeah. something that's um, a negative number, or a, mm -hmm. a non-integer number. So in PyTest, we can actually test if it will raise an exception when you tell it to do a negative number. Should we do an example of that, or should we move on um, to more interesting things? I think time's ticking. Maybe we should go on. But anyway, yeah, okay, the point is, um, if you search PyTest test raises exception, you'll find an example, and it will tell you how you can check does it actually give value error here. OK. Mm. Um, What's the next one? A function which receives two strings and returns a number. OK. Is there any challenge here beyond what we've already done? I mean, yeah, it, it is. I can. I could easily come up with a few examples and um, compare them to the correct result. That does not seem like there's mm -hmm. a lot of complication here. Yeah. This again, like maybe it's not a string. Maybe, maybe it's something different. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think it would uh, raise an error. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at the solution yeah. quickly. And I uh, guess this last one here, word occurrence. So it tests, do does it detect substrings? Which is actually a very yeah. interesting point. So triple A is contained within five A's. Mm -hmm. mm. That's true. And so I'm not sure if that test actually, if uh, that is not the result I would expect from a function called word occurrence. Yeah. yeah. So is the so, test wrong or is the function wrong? Um, I mean, maybe it is. Maybe this is the intended result, but then it, yeah. it, it needs to be documented. I'm a bit surprised. Yeah. So the point here is that by making the test, you, we considered the corner case and realized maybe we need to update our function also. Yeah. Which is good. OK. A function which reads a file and returns a number. Is this worth doing for real or? Um, there's a lot of places in code where you need to read a file. Um, and do something, or where you have a function that reads a file and does something with the contents. You could always split that into one function that reads the file, another one that um, only does the work for the, on the contents, and then test the second one separately. Mm -hmm. But still, um, okay, yeah, I think occasionally testing reading a file is worth the trouble. Um, um, well, it's maybe not complicated enough that we want to go through it in detail. Yeah. Um, the solution, I guess. Um, yeah. Should I just give the solution? Yeah, I guess. Uh, what That's... I would do is make a example file, and the test would be reading that example file, or mm -hmm. a number of example files. Yeah. So if you ask me, this is where my opinion would be, this function is doing too many things. The function is both reading a file and doing some analysis. So doing the analysis is worth testing. Reading the file is difficult to test. So why doesn't this file, why aren't there two functions? One which reads the file and returns maybe the file object or the raw data, and another function which does the counting. And then the one that does the counting is easy to test because I give it some arguments and it gives the results out. 
and the one that reads the file maybe I wouldn't test yet because it's so simple and not worth my time to do this boilerplate code where I make a temporary file, I open the file, I save the data, and then I run it on the file. Yeah, um, the file opening function is a built-in Python thing, so it doesn't need to be tested necessarily. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if this was a really big program that had thousands of users, then yeah, maybe testing the opening the files would be worth it. But for most of what yeah. I do, I don't care that much. And this is a case mm -hmm. where making it easy to test improves the function itself. So for yeah. example, whenever I was working with someone once, they had a lot of really great analysis functions and um, mm, a lot of really great analysis functions, but the, fu the functions read a file and then did the analysis. Instead of doing, so instead of having it separate, so that whenever they wanted to apply this to a new case, like a new kind of project, they had to arrange all of their data in the exact same format, which didn't make sense anymore. So making it easier to test makes it more modular, which incidentally we'll talk about later and would make the code better overall. Okay. What's next? Something with an external dependency. Is this worth testing? I mean, a lot of functions will have external dependencies. It is worth testing unless you are just testing the dependency. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, hopefully the dependency will have its own tests. Yeah. I'm not sure about this one though. Um, so what's the point here? There's max, ah, it's from reactor import max temperature. So this seems like it's really testing whether reactor itself is working correctly. Although you could also think of it as testing whether you understand or the reactor interface correctly or yeah. whether it's working the way you are assuming it should be working for your code. So it might be worth testing. Um, yeah. So, but it, 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 it's an edge case, I probably wouldn't. So, yeah, like is this, yeah. Is this, this is what you said, is it testing if max temperature is set correctly or if changing max temperature changes the function as you expect? Hmm. Well, both, but let's look at the solution and see. So here, this monkey patch is something from PyTest. And you might look at this and say, where is the value of monkey patch coming from? How does PyTest find this? So the answer is this is PyTest magic. So if you give it the name of some standard arguments, it will pass in something to the functions and let you do things like this. So this means monkey pat Oh, do you know the definition of monkey patch? How would you describe it? I think monkey mm. patch is a coding term. One module, like this test function, is changing the value of something on another module reactor when it's really not designed to be changed this way. So in plain language, this code means when this runs on reactor, it will set max temperature to 100. So it's a known value. Then the test can run. And then when the function is over, it will restore it to the previous value. So this allows us to make sure that max temperature is something known. So we're testing only this function and not the external dependency of what is max temperature.
Have you ever done things like this? Mm. I can't think of an example, but I, well, yes, in some case, not often. Yeah. Um, so essentially, um, like replacing something in a library because, um, for example, I cannot, I don't have access to certain hardware that's required to run the library. Mm -hmm. um, you just replace a function in that library um, yeah. with a function of your own yeah. um, and run that instead. Yeah. So in yeah, it, it is a useful thing to do. Yeah. In most of my cases, the max temperature would be a constant. So I would just test the function. And if the function fails, I have to see, did max temperature change or did the function mm -hmm. break? And that's um, a bit unfortunate, but there. But in a case where max temperature is really defined somewhere else in dynamic, you have to do something like this. Or maybe the original function could be defined to take two arguments. It's up to you. OK, should we continue? Yeah. Um... Should we do this as the talk about this and in test driven development, then do that as a demo? Sorry. Um, so first talk about this and then do yeah. test driven development as a demo. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So we have a class here, a Python class. If you haven't seen this before, then don't worry, but we won't explain it now. We see it sets, it models a pet. The pet can be initialized with a name and hunger level. And when we call this go for a walk function, then hunger gets incremented. So how would we test this function? What do we have? What, what's the steps you would have to do? Mm, yeah, you would definitely have to create the object. Um, we have to create the object. And then um, if this is something you wrote for yourself, um, you know that it starts with hunger equals zero. Mm -hmm. So I know one thing you can test is whether the, you can test the init function immediately. Okay, yeah. And then I suppose like, you would run go for a walk a few times with different starting values and check that it increments by one. Yeah. So by starting value, do you yeah. mean we would set hunger to a certain value, then run go for a walk, and then check the final hunger value? Yes. OK, um, yeah. At least that's one thing. Makes sense. Yeah. Should we check the solution? Yeah, Let's see. So pet Fido. Yes, so we check that it's initialized to the value we expect, zero. We walk, and then we test is hunger greater now. OK, that should always work. And then we set hunger to minus one, if that makes any sense. We run go for a walk, and then we check is hunger zero. And I guess what's the lesson here? That whenever we um, have something that changes state, we have to set the state, check or run it, and then check the state after. And this is pretty normal to do. Yeah. OK. Mm, there was also a couple of questions um, about, um, well, for example, a stochastic thing or a thing where you mm -hmm cannot necessarily predict the result. And we did yeah. talk about that a bit, but um, I'm just saying um, it would be good to get there, yeah. um, have time for that as well. Should we go straight to testing randomness next? Um, yeah. Maybe not? let's do that. Um, OK, should we go back to your screen? Uh, OK. Are you ready? So I will or, get a Actually, first, let's freedom. look over the thing here. Yeah. So we want to test randomness. Um, we can try fixed random seeds. So this is where basically you pre-know what the um, value is. 
where we know what the random number generator would make. We can see does it follow the expected distribution, or we can look at it by i and think what the i thing we're looking at. Yeah. And there are often some some uh, hard parameters you can test even in a completely random case mm -hmm. like without setting the the seed. Like you can test that the value is not outside some boundary. Yeah. Um, yeah. That it like, makes sense for what it is. Yeah, like if I was testing randomness first, I would test. Well, I can make a test and not even look at the value. Does the function run without errors? Yeah. Is the That's answer of a dice roll, if I run it a hundred times, is it always between one and six inclusive? And if I trust my random number generator, then that's better than nothing. And we get better from there. Yeah. So if we're testing Yahtzee, do you know how Yahtzee even works? Um, roughly. I mean, you throw dice and then you check if the dice match certain uh, predefined sets. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I guess we can look at the code in more detail. Okay. Um, should I just copy paste the entire code to yeah, I guess. my file? So in yatsi.py. Okay. Okay. So, so what do we have here? Yeah. Um, can you explain? We have a roll dice function, which um, it seems roll. Oh, it rolls number of dice. So um, it returns a list of mm -hmm. um, a random choice between one and six okay. uh, in inclusive integers. And um, yeah, well, yeah. you can in the parameters you can set the number of dice you want to roll. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then Yahtzee. Um, then Yahtzee itself. Um, Pay with five six-sided dice and three draws. Okay, so first you roll some dice and you check. I'm not exactly oh. sure how this will end up mm. um, playing Yahtzee, but let's see. Um, with the most common number um, visible in the dice, I suppose. Uh, That's okay. the most common side. And then how many of those do you have? Okay. So if you have like three fours, this okay. would be four and this would be three. Got it. I yeah. would expect. Um, the most common side is now called the target side. Number of same sides is uh, how often. Um, so how many of those you have? If it's equal to five, you return five. Okay. Um, I guess you get five points from that. Or <laughs> yeah. If you okay. get five of the same, then mm -hmm. that's um, that matches something. Yeah. And you can try again. Um, OK. Throw. Throw um, a second and a third uh, time and do the same thing again. Okay. OK. And then it returns the number of same. So this is counting how, in three throws, how many um, of the same number you can get. And. Um, if you're rolling five dice, right? Yes. Okay. So if it's if you get five of the same, then you don't need to roll again. Then that's the best result you can have. So then you just immediately return that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can we try <laughs> Did that make sense? What it says. Okay. It, to be honest, it doesn't. Looking at all the stuff, it doesn't quite make sense. But mm, we can use it it's as not, a code. It's not a standard Yahtzee game. It's yeah. um, it's a, a much a much simpler version of Yahtzee. Yeah, this is running a number of games and then printing, yeah. um, how many. How many times you got five? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so back to the terminal. Okay. Um, so let's run the code. It did not do anything. If name equals main, why doesn't it print something? That did you save the file? A good question. Uh, okay, I did not. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay. So, so six got it ran a hundred games, and on six of those games, um, we got five dice showing the same result, uh, showing yeah. the same number. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which uh, which is called a Yahtzee, I guess. Okay. Um, so what are the different levels we could test it at? Um, Should we test just the dice roll first? Yes, that um, makes sense. It's it's not a completely trivial function, so it makes sense to test it. Um, in practice, we always throw five dice, but I guess since it's um, general enough, you can test um, test it in different ways. Should I just write test directly into this? Yeah, uh, I'd say let's uh, just throw it file. right in there. So and maybe just directly after the function when testing. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. So in the solution, it says test roll dice. Mm -hmm with no arguments yeah. and the solution suggests we set the random number generator c to zero and then uh, we okay. test the actual that makes sense. so in this function random.seed it's so in random number generators there's something called a seed and if you start with the same seed the generator will always give the same values out so that by giving the seed, we should be able to predict what comes out. So we can assert roll dice five equals. Okay. Whoops, assert. Roll dice five. Five equals the list. And from okay. the solution, the values are four, four, one, three, five. So what's the problem here? Okay what could be a problem here what if python's random number generator has changed since we last did this workshop yeah well then the numbers would be different yeah so, and i guess this test doesn't really tell you whether the roll dice function has broken or whether random has just changed in some way yeah should we try running it and let's see if this works mm, yeah So pytest.yatsi.py. No test. It didn't find a test because oh, I didn't save, save it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Trying again and it passed. Okay, so it so, didn't change. So yeah. this actually works pretty well for testing this function, I guess. So what's the disadvantage though? Hmm. If the function changes, these outputs would change. So it will verify it's always giving the same output but it doesn't give you any flexibility for changing how the dice are rolled because then it would give something different. Yeah. Should we go to um, next? So there's test Yahtzee. So okay. maybe this so one you should we test copy this? from the notes. Okay. So basically, in this test, it will play Yahtzee one million times. And we'll check, did we win approximately 4.6% of these million games? OK. This also sets a random seed. Yeah. So this time, we don't have the problem that if random changes, then the result will change because um, actually with any seed, it should be roughly the same, approximately the same result. If you're running it enough times, it, it should work. Yeah. Okay. The downside is that it takes a while. Yeah. Okay. Okay, it's done. And now it says two tests passed. Good. So. It was the correct number of yeah. um, wins. Yes. Um, so I guess this is in the category of testing distributions. We we check that the um, we we set up a specific version of of whatever random process is running, and it needs to give an, uh, some correct number plus minus whatever random error. Yeah. Okay. Let's go back to my screen and see what is next.
So we did this testing randomness with Yahtzee. Designing an end-to-end -end test. Maybe we should go to discussion now and let's see what people say. So please start asking your hard testing questions. So we'll get something. Uh, designing an end-to-end -end test. Hmm. So this is basically, this is a bit hard to read quickly. So it's basically some shell function, the unique command, and how would you test that? And basically you give it some input data and you check is the output what you expect. And this is also a pretty reasonable way to test something. So instead of each individual function, just run the whole thing on some known data. Do you have any comments here? Mm. Well, I mean, this is something that's very common with um, uh, yeah. with my projects. So that they include some test data, and you run um, some like full process of you. You take some actual processing steps, and it should always produce the same expected result. Yeah. Um, as long as there's no randomness involved, right. this yeah. is a like, very useful test. Yeah. A very useful type of test. Yeah. The okay. downside is that it doesn't give you a lot of detail. If it fails, you only know that your process fails. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully you also have a unit test mm -hmm. failing at that mm -hmm. point. Yeah. But if not, you kind of need to go in, dig in and figure out what's yeah. going on. Yeah. I mean, my philosophy would be if the end-to-end -end test failed, at least I know and I'm in the same place I would be otherwise, yeah. which is go down and debug it. Yeah. And maybe I would use the opportunity to guess where it is and make some unit test now that I know how it can fail or what's likely. Let's go on. More end-to-end -end testing, create an actual end-to-end -end test. I think we don't have time for this. Let's go to the notes and see what yeah. good questions people have. So down to test design. There was this good question. Do you have a practical way to test low level functions that interact with external hardware? I think that's probably answered there well enough. Yeah, I think we talked about something like that. Yeah, yeah. How to design a test without running a whole solver whenever it's very complex like this. Hmm. I guess, yeah, can you break it down to several small subroutines? Can you give it a, what's the simplest problem that has a known non-trivial value? So this is not exactly answering this question, but some of the tests that I was most proud of, it was during my postdoc, I was had to generate random graphs according to some particular algorithm. And the algorithm was in fact the thing that the research was about. So I had nothing to compare to. So how would I test this kind of thing? Well, of course I ran it and looked at it by eye, but is there some glaring bug here? So here's what I did. My algorithm took some parameters, basically the problem, the, the probability of making links in certain forms. So I set this probability to zero, and then I should get an empty graph out of it. And then I did it again, and I set the probability to one, and I should get a complete graph. And since there were two or three different parameters going in, I could do different combinations of these parameters, 0, 0, 1, um, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, with different probabilities that are 1 and 0, and see is the graph that comes out what I expect, which is usually either a complete graph or an incomplete graph or some known number of edges in there. 
and this actually let me define some bugs in my code that I couldn't see by eye. And I was really happy with figuring this out. So I think that's a good example of end-to-end. -end. Well, yep. Is it end-to-end -end or is it integration? I'm not sure what kind of test it is. But in the end, the name doesn't matter. The mm -hmm. point is it yeah. worked. I guess that's an end-to-end an end -end test. Um, so it's not it's not checking whether multiple libraries work together. Yeah, um, yeah. OK, a good workflow in Python. What's this question? If I do a test, it will apply to a version of the code. I need to add a test to a new function. Do I need a test? This is a really good point. So test-driven design. This is something we skipped in the previous lesson. You can, in fact, write a test before you write the function itself. So this is, is it extreme programming or something like that, test-driven development? Anyway, once I saw it written this way, you want to add some new functionality. You make the test for it. And then you run the test code and you see it fails because the function isn't defined. Good. Now you keep write code until that test passes. So this ensures that everything you do has a test and you think about how you want to use the function before you write it. So, uh, so this is basically defining what the, what the functionality should be before you start writing it and mm -hmm. first writing down what the function should do um, yeah. and only then writing the function which um, mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. Mm. But it really depends on how you want to do things. So I've used all kinds of strategies and I've rare, I don't think I've ever done anything that's pure test-driven development. I guess, I guess test-driven development does, it requires that you can define what what the end result is, um, that you know what the end result is before you start working on it. Um, and that works in small steps, um, but it usually almost never works for an entire new feature or a new code base, mm -hmm. um, especially in a new resource software. It's yeah. uh, unlikely to stay, uh, the requirement is unlikely to stay the same. Yeah. This next question, some kind of research test which determines how successful the proposed approach is. If you can define an overall success as a test, then I would definitely do that and probably start with that. Hmm. It's relatively easy and probably high impact because you can quickly run it to see where your errors are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, it 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 relies on you knowing what the result should be. Um, so you can probably know some features of it, like a range or errors or how fast mm -hmm. it should be. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But often, not exactly what the number is at the end, because if you knew that, yeah. then probably you didn't. You wouldn't write the code. Yeah. This next question, uh, I have no tests working with images. This idea of getting yeah. some test images with uh, easy cases, manually annotating and comparing, I mean, yeah, that sounds exactly like what I would do. Of course, it can yeah. be difficult to um, make the initial images, but I mean, if you don't have some test data for something like this, I mean, you're going to be looking at some images to see if it's correct anyway. So why not make an image that is doesn't have any confidential data and is small, add it to your repository, and then it saves you a lot of looking 
separately every time you make a change. Do you consider, should we look at this screenshot here? Mm -hmm. Example of how research test is formulated, can we comment? Um, the question, ideally parameters shouldn't be hard coded, but uploaded them from a file. Um, I mean, if it's easy to hard code, then why not start with that? So in, in an, but, so is it a test? I guess it is, if, if it's a test, then hard coding parameters often is, they often yeah. make sense. Um, yeah, test. You will change them much less often than in, an, when you're running an actual code. So hard coding is much less of a problem. Yeah. So it looks like, ah, uh, so yeah, so there's different use cases depending on the parameter. It will either run the first use case or the second use case, and then it will see, does it give the right output? I mean, this is better than... Where is the... Where's the check? Where's the check? Or is it checking if it runs? Is this a check here? Oh, it's an equal sign. Would that be a comparison? That... Or maybe the test is below lower and we uh, don't see it. Be. Yeah. But I mean, I as mean... a starting point, I would start here, and if there get to be so many test cases I can't keep track of them, then I'd probably start splitting them out, but... So one small thing here is that the which test cases run is hard-coded here. Um, so I guess what I would do is turn this into a function and then mm -hmm. run it with mm -hmm. two different input parameters, either use case equals one or, or first use case equals zero and then use case equals one. Mm -hmm. um, of course, then you could instead of um or instead of use case is as only single parameter you could um include all of those numbers uh, all of those parameters wow. um mm -hmm. into the function parameters um makes sense then it then you could easily run both cases post test cases in a single um, script yeah okay if a test fails how does it fail what will be printed or what? So with it depends on the frame. Wait. Ah, this is commenting on that. I think there's a lot there. So let's go to the last question before the lunch break. Does a big project include test codes in source code or see only final? So for every good open source project I know of, the test code is included in with the actual code itself. There's little reason not to and it really improves confidence of things yeah. if you want people to be modifying it and improving it and if not well i mean yeah i guess someone could release the code without the test code but then don't expect other people to be able to contribute to it that well or, um, yeah, if um, if the tests are not included, then you cannot check that you installed it correctly, mm -hmm. um, or at least it's not easy to check that you installed it correctly. So, yeah. also for that reason, it's good to include the tests. So, um, did we miss anything? I'm not seeing many chat messages or other questions. Hopefully. So should we, well, what's the overall summary here? So we've seen different ways to write code, which ensures other code works. And by making it automatic, you can run it much more often than you could otherwise. And it will hopefully make your code more correct. But more importantly, it makes your development easier. Like the few times that I've started with test really quit early for some research code where I didn't even know what the answer should be. 
I've been really happy because I run this, I can see all my really simple syntax errors and debugging error, error, or syntax errors and so on much faster than I could otherwise. And then I could use my brain, my, do manual effort for tests and checks, which are not easy to automate and actually are difficult. So with that said, do you have any other final wrap-ups? Um, well, um, having to test run automatically is super helpful because you will forget to run them otherwise. Um, so we've seen to, how to do it, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just automating it, making it as easy as possible mm -hmm. is um, is an important thing. Yeah. And it's also useful for others because of course, um, it's much easier to, to get everyone else to run the tests when they don't actually even need to run them. They will just run automatically. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I guess we should go now. At least I need to get or go out quickly. Yeah. So thank you and yeah. see you in about an hour. Have a good lunch break. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.